my name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. One of you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television. Coming to you from London, but reviewing the whole world and previewing what the world will look like in 2023. Every year is momentous to a degree, certainly every one that I've lived, at least since becoming a politically conscious adult, but 2022 probably beats most of the others. It has contained so many momentous events which will reverberate throughout next year and perhaps for decades to come that it would take a short series of Kale Mahoras to fully cover it. Obviously, the biggest of the big stories has been the conflict in Ukraine between NATO and the Russian Federation fought out over the territory and increasingly the dead bodies of Ukraine. This conflict has accelerated the shifting of the tectonic plates across the globe, economically, culturally, politically, in terms of alliances, all kinds of things have changed and changed utterly. But it has not been the only story, although it may lie at the core of many of them. The economic situation in Western countries is entering a deep freeze, a freeze from which we may not emerge recognizably the same again, a freeze which might bring down governments, might destroy economies, and is certainly already causing intense anguish and pain throughout Europe and maybe soon throughout North America in particular in Germany, with its energy dependency on Russia, more than 50% of its energy came from there, the blowing up of its Nord Stream 2 pipeline by agents of Western governments, and the political pain that is now being suffered by the German government. Just in the last days of 2022, a plot led by a nephew of the Kaiser. I'm not making this up. A great nephew of the Kaiser, one of the German aristocracy, but involving former military officers and other figures on the right and far right of German politics was unmasked. Almost exactly a hundred years to the day since that other plot, the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in 1922. The leader of that putsch was a man called Adolf Hitler. No one knows what happened to him after that. The political turmoil, the economic turmoil, and of course the raging military conflict still continuing as we speak are obviously the biggest of the big issues, but there have been many others. The continuing crucifixion in a British jail of the world historic publisher, journalist, truth teller, Julian Assange is beginning to look like a Christmas that will never be forgotten. A Christmas in Belmarsh jail and a new year on the airplane to a supermax penitentiary in the United States of America, unless, unless the courts either here in Britain or perhaps more likely on the European continent step in. There have been many other political events, 
the ongoing refusal of the former President Donald Trump to accept his defeat and his announcement that he's going to make one last try. The decline into cognitive, visible cognitive imbecility of the current President of the United States, Joe Biden, who can now scarcely say his name even when it's written large on an auto cue. Never has there been a time of greater challenges, certainly not since 1940, and there are no Churchills in this picture. The leadership of the Western world has passed to men, and sometimes women, of straw. I don't know how many prime ministers, finance ministers, interior ministers and foreign ministers we have had in Britain in 2022. I mean literally I don't know. And I follow politics on an hourly basis, if not minute by minute. I've lost track of the incredibly volatile and unstable political situation in Britain. And Morocco have done everybody proud in the World Cup. A tremendous revival in Arab national spirit, in Muslim self-confidence, has been led by the lions of Morocco. Who would have predicted that? Along with the shift of Saudi Arabia's core allegiance from all these decades, of British and American empire to the new powers of China and even Russia. The tectonic plates are shifting and I am joined by a group of distinguished experts. I'm just the enthusiastic amateur. No more distinguished than my former parliamentary colleague and comrade in arms in one or two important struggles, although diametrically opposed politically. Nigel West is the prominent spy and espionage writer, a novelist and an historian of the first rank. And so I'm going to give the floor to him first. Nigel, it's been a big year, sum up for us from your point of view. Well, I think the tragedy is that just as we thought that we were getting over the COVID crisis, along comes Vladimir Putin. And, and this tragedy is going to be with us for years if Putin is with us for years. And if we're looking forward to the year ahead, uh, my guess is that he won't be with us for very long. I don't know whether it'll be a helicopter crash or something else. But if you can imagine for a moment the world without Vladimir Putin, that would be a very dramatic change, almost as much as the attack on Ukraine. So if my auntie had a beard, she'd be my uncle. Stick to what's happened first, and then we'll look forward to 2023. <laughs> well, I, I think that the, the big issue for me was the Ukraine and the tragedy that followed from that, and then the, U, the economic fallout, the consequences, which have been global. It doesn't matter whether it's food failing to be exported from the Ukraine to the rest of the world, or whether it's, as you say, the German dependency on Russian energy. This is a lesson to us all, and it's profound and it'll be lasting. What do you make of events in our former workplace? Uh, I, I, I half jokingly, though only half, talked about the, the, the musical chairs that there's been at the top of the British government. I don't know what your relationship was with your whips but I had a very interesting relationship with my whips. But I trusted my whips. And there were two things about the whips office that were so terribly important. The first was that they never spoke in the chamber, as you, as you know, but secondly, they weren't allowed to speak to the media. And I remember Andrew Mitchell being a whip and seeing him briefing journalists in the uh, members' lobby of the Commons. And I thought, that is so brazen. I'm never going to trust the whip's office again. And something has gone very badly wrong. I think Mrs Thatcher is to blame because she used the whip's office as a stepping stone for ministerial office. Whereas it used to be perder, people who were appointed to the whip's office had enormous influence, uh, 
they could um, influence the way uh, legislation went through the Commons. Uh, they were a, a channel to the cabinet of how the troops were feeling on particular issues. They fulfilled a very important role. And then suddenly you discover that the person who's been appointed deputy uh, chief whip was thrown out of the, the foreign office as a junior minister for propositioning the staff. And so it seems to me that the idea of discipline within the party, I know that's a word that you and I have difficulty dealing with, but there was discipline within parliamentary parties and that's how you get through legislation and you get things done. And all of that has, has gone and I don't know really how parliament recovers from that. The only other issue that I think is of enormous importance, we have failed in all of these years to find a way of funding political parties apart from selling knight, uh, peerages and knighthoods. Uh, and that has to be wrong. Mark Wadsworth is a genuine comrade in arms of mine and for many, many decades, though none of us look like we've been around for many, many decades, I know. Mark, uh, politically speaking, your politics, my politics is now a gas that's at a low peep, as we say in Scotland. The fire has gone out of British politics from a left-wing point of view, hasn't it? Well, I think we sometimes make a mistake of just looking at this from <clears throat> a British perspective. Yes, Corbynism was defeated. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn, a left-wing leader of the opposition Labour Party, is no longer there. But let's look around the rest of the world. In South America, there's been a surge of socialism. In Peru, in Colombia, in Chile, in Brazil, in the global south, in Mali, uh, you see an African nation kicking the French colonial power out and embracing the Russians. There are 14 uh, countries in uh, Africa that still use uh, the French franc, it's, it's ghastly. And so we are seeing a change. You talked about that tectonic plate shift with Saudi Arabia looking to China, uh, looking even to Russia. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, getting their act together. Uh, the social movements in Britain, outside of parliament, Extinction Rebellion, um, the environmental organisations like Occupy, uh, the women's movement, Sarah Everard, a woman who was murdered by a serving police officer, um, <clears throat> the Black Lives Matter movement, the trade unions and their strikes. So I am filled with optimism that the mood has moved away from that care home called the House of Commons and Parliament and its arthritic politics to something much more exciting outside of it. Deepa Driver, Dr. Driver, I suppose the, uh, I'm perhaps being presumptuous, but I suppose that the big issue for you in 2022 was the continued incarceration of Julian Assange, for whom you've campaigned indefatigably. Um, indeed, that and the trade union strikes, of course, which I've, um, I've been proud to be part of as one of the negotiators for UCU. Um, Yes, it, it, I think it has been a, a really difficult year for press freedom, democracy and human rights in Britain because on a variety of levels, human rights have been undermined, the right to protest has been undermined, the right to free expression has been undermined, press freedom has been undermined, human rights have been undermined. And all of this has happened while British politicians get better at writing on Twitter how much they care about press freedom and human rights all over the world. So yes, the case of Julian Assange is particularly at a critical stage now, given that somebody who didn't commit any crimes is now going to be put in prison by the war criminals. So yes. Are you pessimistic about the prospects of an escape even at this 11th hour? I think the forces against Julian are extremely resourceful and extremely powerful. I do think that the mood has changed 
not just in Britain, but across Europe in relation to the Assange case. I think people have begun to understand through, for example, the film about the family Ithaca, the, the books by Niels Melser and Stefania Maurici, ex exposing the corruption at the heart of the persecution of Assange. But also people having come out of the pandemic have begun to understand how newspapers and politicians manipulate the narrative and how it affects them as individuals. And so I think people are starting to, at a very basic level, put two and two together and understand what's really going on in the world and what's really, what the persecution of Assange is really about. Because so far, you know, if you look at Latin America and countries, for example, where British and American uh, establishments have been involved in coups, people understand when there is a smear campaign, etc. People can see through it. I think people in Britain and America are less able or less used to seeing through it. And all of a sudden, the pandemic has helped really break, break open the debate. Now, uh, Nigel West uh, talked about the importance, and correctly so, of the events in Ukraine. Let's go over to Donetsk, where a war and investigative journalist Johnny Miller joins us. Johnny, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Johnny, you, of course, come from the UK, but you've also been living now in one war zone after another. Uh, people around the world are wondering what's going to happen in those war zones in 2023. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, apologies, first of all, for doing this interview in my overcoat. Uh, it's freezing cold in my uh, apartment. Uh, the heating does come on in the evening, but not during the day. And increasingly, that's what it's like for so many people in Ukraine. Uh, I'm in Donbass, Russian-controlled uh, territory at the moment. The heating at the electricity is okay. Water comes on about once a week. In Ukraine, in Kiev, it's hardly any electricity, hardly any water. And for this whole country, uh, these are the kind of conditions that people are living in. For example, I have to wait when the water comes on. I have to run to the shower, fills up, have a cold shower, fill up water bottles, wash my clothes. Uh, and that's the conditions that, that people are, are living in. And in 2023, at the moment, it looks like it's only going to get worse for the majority of people uh, in Ukraine. In Russia, it's very different. Uh, this is a war zone that I'm in right now. But if you go to Rostov, the nearest Russian city uh, to me, or in Moscow, it, it feels like its life is normal. The, the war that's happening here, it really, the Russians call it a special military operation. For people in, in Moscow, it does really feel like a special military operation, a war that's happening on the edge of the empire, so to speak. Uh, and of course, many people are being mobilized there, so it's changed a bit now. But life is carrying on as normal. The Christmas lights are up, people are out having fun. Uh, and the same situation in London, I believe. I haven't been back there since. I know people are suffering for very many reasons, but life is sort of continuing while NATO and Russia fighting this proxy war uh, in Ukraine, leading to the deaths of uh, hundreds. At the moment, the, the soldier casualties around Barmut might be over 100 a day. And of course, civilians are dying uh, here. Just yesterday, I was out in the street reporting from a youth center that Ukraine bombed with bodies lying uh, in the street. Um, so it's um, as, most, as much of Europe and Russia continue to suffer because of economic problems uh, here in Ukraine, it's, it's far worse. I mean, in terms of what's going to happen in 2023, one of the most interesting shoots I did was when I went to the front line just uh, about a week ago, interviewing Russian volunteers, Russian soldiers uh, on the outskirts of Donetsk. And I conducted interviews with many of those soldiers. And many of them said to me that they feel that they're fighting in the opening stages of World War III. Uh, and interviewing these soldiers in our position was hit by an RPG as well. And interviewing these soldiers in a kind of desolate, wintry wasteland, the gray zone of, of the, the front line outside Donetsk, the soldiers telling you they're thinking that fighting in the opening stages of World War III uh, was pretty worrying and dramatic. And of course, they're referring to this potential standoff, which has been developing, I think, for many years between NATO countries uh, and Russia, China, Iran. Uh, and that's, I think, the danger that we're going to be moving into to, to in 2023. How do people over there, where you are now, uh, in, in the Ukraine, in Russia, how are they looking at the year to come? With optimism or pessimism? 
Well, it's, I mean, this is a very, this is very much a micro community here in, in Donetsk, in Russian controlled uh, Donbass. People were, have been, they've been fighting essentially a, a cold war, sometimes a hot war for the last eight years against the Ukrainian uh, nationalists, the Ukrainian government. And when the Russians invaded, uh, when the, uh, in February, there was a lot of excitement here in Donbass. They felt that it was all going to end. They thought that the, the Russian operation would be over quite quickly. The shelling of Donbass, Donetsk would end. It hasn't. It's been, uh, what, it's been eight months now. And so I was here about three months ago, and there was still a very excited uh, vibe. We felt, they felt that they were going to um, win. It was going to be over soon. Now it's, it's turned to a more pessimistic mood, uh, just as autumn and winter has set in because the shelling is still happening. It's increased in the last few days, and still Ukraine is on the, the outskirts of the city. So now amongst people here, there's, there's a much more downbeat mood, especially as Ukraine has had success in the north of Donbass and around uh, Kherson. Uh, but they still see, feel very, very resolute. I think the Russian government still feels confident that it will, it will succeed in the long term uh, in Ukraine. Um, but here, uh, maybe it's just a winter mood as well, but people are, are certainly more downbeat than they were four or five months ago. Uh, and in Russia, I was in uh, Moscow <coughs> <excuse> me, <coughs> at the beginning of this war. And as I said, people, it was just a war at the end, edge of the empire. Because of the mobilization, 300,000 soldiers, there is more of a, of a difference. Of course, huge amounts of people have left Russia, particularly in Moscow, St. Petersburg, more kind of Western looking uh, liberal classes. Have, a lot of people have left uh, and many people uh, worried about mobilization. And so now in Moscow, because of that, there is more of a downbeat feeling in, in, in Russia, as I understand it uh, as well. As a, a journalist, you, you talk all the time to people in authority. Can you give us some sense of how people are feeling there, how confident or otherwise they are about the future? And maybe even compare that with what you know of feelings in the UK at this point in time. Yeah, I don't know. It's difficult. I mean, because there's also a cultural element there. I mean, I haven't spent... I mean, where I am in now in Donbass, it's, it's different culturally than, than the rest of Russia. People are very pro-Russian and they feel Russian, but it's also a micro-culture here. They say people in Donbass are more Russian than, than Russians, I think because they have to... Um, um, assert their cultural identity as being different to Ukraine. Um, but there's also a cultural element. I mean, and Russians are famously kind of um, seem a bit down sometimes. Somebody told me if in, in Moscow, if, if you smile, you must, be, uh, you must be insane. And it's a kind of Russian dark humor, which is quite similar to British humor, actually, I think. So it's, there's also a bit of, bit of a cultural element um, there, I think. Um, but in terms of uh, Ukraine, I think the Russian uh, Russian government, Russian people are very confident that they will win in Ukraine. Um, economically, it hasn't hugely affected Russia. Certain people have been hugely affected, people who work within trade with the, rest, uh, the West, etc. But I think, um, and, and, and indeed even in, in, in countries, there's huge differences. I mean, in Britain, half the country supported Brexit, half the country didn't. In Russia, Vladimir Putin has huge support, but there's also parts of the Russian population who are, who are anti this war. So it's very difficult to generalize, I think. Uh, and I haven't been back in Britain for some time, so I can't really answer, answer that. But I think, um, I think ordinary people, I think in Russia, they seem determined that they will win out, but of course, worried about how the world is going, I think. Will Russia and China grow ever closer in 2023 as a result of the international situation? Well, yeah, I, th I think there, there used to be an American policy of trying to keep Russia and China apart, but it's clearly uh, the, their actions are largely in provoking this war by moving NATO into Ukraine um, has inevitably moved Russia and China together. Iran as well, of course, uh, huge, increasing cooperation with Russia and China. Uh, so you're starting to see uh, a block, you know, um, develop. Um, and that's, that's the con concern, certainly for myself as well. You're also seeing more persecution of journalists uh, in the West. And the more that this war rhetoric is, is going to increase, the more repression uh, against voices you may well see in, in, both, in both spheres, actually. Um, so certainly Russia, China, Iran are certainly moving closer because of uh, Western and NATO actions in Ukraine. That, that's certainly clear.
Much more of this coming up in the second half. Stay tuned. You're watching Callum O'Hara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, talking about the world. And we've only just scratched the surface of the great issues of 22. But inevitably, we must look forward at this time of year to what's going to happen in 23. But before we do, Mark Wadsworth, I realised when Dr Deepa was talking that in my soliloquy at the beginning, I didn't even mention COVID. Now, isn't it somewhat extraordinary that this time last year we would have been speaking about nothing else, and by this time this year, the issue has almost disappeared. What do we conclude from that? Well, it hasn't disappeared because what's unfolding now is the level of corruption of the Tory government. £30 million pocketed by a Conservative peer. Moan. Allegedly. Yeah, well, we don't, we right, don't know yes, that. There's an investigation alleged, being done. Allegedly. Yeah. Well, you know, and the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, said he was totally shocked by what he'd heard and that the Conservative whip had been withdrawn, that she'd withdrawn from the House of Lords. I mean, people with their next door neighbours. I think that was uh, uh, Matt Hancock uh, and a publican, somebody else and a mechanic, getting millions of pounds worth of uh, contract from the government. When this happens in the global south, we're regaled with stories about how corrupt people are in the de so-called developing world. But what about here? in the heart, the mother of so-called democracy and how they've been helping themselves. And yes, we've come out of two years, three years of pandemic, not seen for a hundred years, but it's a... Well, it, I suppose uh, all of that is legitimate, uh, prefaced with the words allegedly. Uh, but mustn't we begin to think, if not conclude, that, that the whole <laughs> COVID thing was oversold, that the danger of it was oversold, that the uh, efficacy Oh, George, of, uh, you're forgetting those terrible pictures in the intensive care units. Millions of people did die from this pandemic. I mean, it is really quite extraordinary how it was dealt with. And listen, I agree with you, if there was profiteering yeah. by people off the backs of other people's suffering, that is unforgivable and people will go after them and get them. But let's give this this woman a fair trial. I mean, let's not just ha hang her out to dry before we know what the facts are. But I'm not just talking about her, I'm talking about government sure. ministers no, no, who I'm... used a VIP fast track to get contracts for their mates and stick their snouts in the pig trough. Well, but That's a fact. Im imagine this for a moment, that you're a member of parliament and in your constituency there's somebody who makes frocks, for example, calls you and says, listen, I've got spare capacity, there's been an appeal for people to make PPE, I'm willing to do so. And as a member of parliament, do you just simply write in a letter or if you're told by the department, there is a fast track uh, available for people who've got this kind of capacity and ability and they have the recommendation of a member of parliament, uh, I think that that's all to the good. We would be complaining if the procurement program took two years to, to get yeah, through. Although the problem, Nigel, is that much of what was bought was useless and was produced by people who'd never produced it before. And their only claim to the contract was proximity to the Member of Parliament and uh, Minister. But let's not uh, get too sidetracked on that issue. Uh, let's talk to... Professor Arshan Adib Makadam from Cambridge University. He is a professor in global thought and comparative philosophies, first at SOAS and now at 
Cambridge. Professor, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Professor, how do you see the current balance of power in the world and the one that we'll have in 23? Well, the balance of power on a global level is changing swiftly. Um, and indeed, we have moved from the period that was called the unipolar moment in global history, right after the end of the Cold War in 1989-1990, when there was a short period in international relations when the United States dominated international politics. We have moved away from that type of um, system from that type of order towards a more diffuse, a more disorderly system that uh, you know does not necessarily yield itself to easy forecasts. That's one of the things that you know even analysts, even scholars, even those that are pretending to know have to admit. Because once you admit that humble predisposition, the analysis gets better. So we need to get into the nitty gritty of the changes that, that, that are appearing right now. And we don't have our, um, you know, well, if you like, um, structured world of the Cold War anymore. We don't have that um, unipolar moment that I mentioned anymore. Power is coming from, from everywhere. So you have, um, you know, of course, the situation in Ukraine, which is indicative of Russia, um, being assertive in a militaristic um, sense. Um, there is, you know, various other poles of power that we can look at. You said something very interesting to me that, of course, the, the unipolar world is now obviously over. Even the authors of it know that. But you use the phrase that power is now coming from everywhere. Can you give us your definition or your understanding of what power today actually is? Um, the nature of power is changing quite radically um, uh, as well. Um, you know, the locus of power, where does power come from? It used to be um, the military industrial complex, for instance, that people have talked about, you know, Noam Chomsky, Herman and others. Um, it, you know, in many ways, people wish that this would be the locus of power, easily identifiable, and we could, you know, um, go on the barricades and, and, and protest against abuse of that type of power. Um, but today, you know, we are all kind of um, under the big lens of, of, of Big Brother in a way that we weren't even a decade ago, um, because power is now infused with uh, technology, right? And technology allows um, you know, other low key of power to access us in a way that it couldn't before. The very fact that we are pre-recording this um, interview on Zoom is indicative of the new virtual world that we are, we are living in, where power is coming from the ethers of the World Wide Web, where AI infused algorithms determine our mortgage applications and whether or not we are attractive even. Um, so, you know, power is diffused in a way that it wasn't before. And it is also more intrusive exactly because of the various loci that I tried to describe. I'm sure our viewers would like your prediction as to whether they're going to have a better life in 2023. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, when the nature of power changes and when it becomes more diffuse and more penetrative as it is right now, um, you know, it is that much more difficult to escape from it as well. So in our day to day lives, we're certainly more um, accessible, right? So if power wants to operate on us, it can do so through our Alexas, through our you know, Google Cloud, through the iPhone, through the various technological devices that we are using on a daily basis, and which make us more exposed to you know, nefarious forms of power if you know, that agent wants to. Okay? So certainly being um, an agent of our own fate is rather more difficult within a constellation like this, right? Um, it starts by you know going outside and being on CCTV everywhere. So you you are certainly being um, uh, watched, and there is then that element of 
of a, a contraction of freedom, if you like, uh, in the way that we used to define freedom as also the freedom of privacy, right? The freedom to be left alone. This is very important, and it's one of the subjects of of, of a forthcoming book that I that that you know I I try to kind of pen together um, with these uh, new forms of of artificial intelligence. So the idea here uh, is that these forms of power are more intrusive. Um, and they contract the space for truly free, uninhibited expression of, um, you know, whatever form of expression it is, right? But at the same time, and that's a conceptual, almost scientific law that comes from, you know, various forms of scholarship, where there's power, there's always also resistance. I mean, this is the famous phrase of, the, you know, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher of the 20th century, right? So when power changes, resistance to it changes as well. So we are experiencing different forms of resistance, whether it's online hacktivism, for instance, or other forms of resistance that are implicated in these new forms of power and at the same time changing with it. So you know, where there's power, there is always resistance. So there's always the hope to express one's subjectivity, one's agency, to, you know, escape um, the, the shackles of, of technology, for sure. In summary, you think that 2023 will be a world in which more people are more controlled than ever before, is that correct? I think the effort to be more controlled will be there. And I think that will, um, technology gives um, the state, you know, tech companies, businesses, the ability to to do so. Um, so for sure, this will continue. It's a trend that is pre-existent, but it will it will continue. This is the so-called industrial revolution 4.0, and 2023 will be another major year in that direction. But at the same time, um, you know, humanity has shown in the past and present. Um, that it, 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 it wants to be free, right? We want to be free. We don't want to be controlled. We don't want to be securitized. We don't want to be objects of um, ideology or whatever it is. Um, and so at the same time, while this trend is going to continue, um, the various forms of resistance will adopt to that and continue as well. Dr. Deepa, you're uh, not just a trade union uh, leading figure, but, uh, but an academic. Listening to that, should we be afraid or be very afraid? <laughs> I would say be very afraid because on the one hand, you know, um, there are people like Assange, for example, who are allowing the public interest um, to surface through bringing together very good people and creating a rebalancing of the power of the state, where instead of the state constantly surveilling us, WikiLeaks allowed us to surveil the state. And there will be people like this who, uh, be because as the professor said, um, there is a, an opposition to this kind of super control, there will be people who stand up. But I think we have to recognize the magnitude of the kind of power on the other side. I mean, this is we are in a situation where we have a government which has written off eight billion pounds worth of PPE on the bill of the NHS out of, I believe, 12 billion that was spent. And it has done this at a time when it is unwilling to feed children in primary schools. And rich people are getting richer, they're getting more powerful, but it also offers a brilliant opportunity for the modern equivalent of the guillotine, because when power becomes so uncontrollable and so rampant and so unmoderated, people have very little to lose. And that's something that powerful people have understood in the past, but are less willing to understand at the moment. Nigel West, we uh, grew up in a period where power was quite predictable. There were two blocks, uh, a balance was kept, sometimes miraculously between them. There was no world war. There were local proxy wars and so on. We've just heard from the professor about how diffuse power is now and how the, never mind the, the dual power that used to exist, that's gone. But the unipower, a unipolar world, 
which lasted, we can now see, no more than 15 years, has also now gone. We have a multipolar. That a, poses a problem for a writer like you, apart from anything else. Not at all. I'm in my element because this is rewriting history. And as we are living here today, we're seeing history change. Let me, let me remind you, the Soviet Union ceased to exist in three days. The Arab Spring started when one man was extorted in uh, a market in Tunisia. Uh, it is really incredible what has happened around the globe. It's people power. It's why Vladimir Putin was so, is so worried about uh, crowds on the street and demonstrators. I gave lunch a few days ago to a girl who's, who's left Russia and she, she, took, she spent her entire life in Russia. And she said the big thing that she sees here in London, she says, why are there no police on the tube? And every platform in Moscow, there are police. On every street corner, there are police. Putin is terrified of demonstrations. And if we see demonstrations, perhaps in Moscow, then the world will change yet again. And we'll look back on this period as a period of dramatic change. Well, power I, or no I, power, I, power to the people. I, I, I give you the floor to state your prediction of what will happen to Vladimir Putin in 2023, just so I can cut it out and keep it and play it back to you next year. Go ahead. I, I think that the loss of Vladimir Putin in this tragic helicopter accident uh, will be celebrated around the world, particularly by the people who he has uh, subjected to terrible deprivation in the Ukraine and in his own country. This is, he has been disastrous. I was a supporter of Vladimir Putin when he first came to power because I had friends in the KGB. It may sound odd to you, but I had two KGB co-authors. I wrote books with them. And these were people who had traveled abroad and they knew the truth. And Vladimir Putin was one of those people who admittedly had only got as far as the GDR but he was part of an elite within the first chief directorate. And what frightened him more than anything else was when he called for help, when the GDR was collapsing, he called the first guards tank regiment in Dresden and the, the commander said, I'm not prepared to move my troops until I've got permission from Moscow and Moscow is not answering the telephone. Yes, well, <laughs> I must read that book. Uh, the, uh, World situation you summarized in the beginning as uh, filled with hope, although I've got to tell you the president of Peru has now been overthrown in a coup. Uh, so what goes up can come down, but notwithstanding, and Cristina Kirchner, the vice president of Argentina has now been sent to prison for six years. But the left is still in power in Cuba and Venezuela. Well, that will always be so, God willing. But the... Uh, the pink tide, I like to call it, rather than a red tide in Latin America, is changeable like all tides. It comes in and uh, goes out. How optimistic are you for the next year? It sounds like you think the wind, the wind is at your sails. Well, we're in the middle of a winter of discontent. You've got Tory newspapers calling it a general strike, mm. uh, not seen since the 1920s. And so that uh, bodes well for what the good professor described as resistance, mm. the resistance against uh, massive power, monopolised power, the greedy helping themselves off the backs of misery, as Nigel has, uh, from the right of the political uh, spectrum, uh, denounced. Uh, you know, this isn't just a left-right thing. And I think you've said on previous shows that there's been a realignment in terms of what is left what's and left, what is, what's right. What is, what is right. And um, we in the liberation movement uh, will continue to fight with our allies. Uh, we're cross-party, so we're not saying we're just uh, the usual crowd in the Labour Party or uh, the peace nicks. This is all people who want to be liberated from uh, Big Brother, Big Sister, you know, the monopoly power that oppresses us by spying on us, by uh, affecting our ability to talk to each other in a democracy. You've seen these draconian laws that have been brought in by the uh, government uh, 
to clamp down on protest, to clamp down on democracy, and the fact that we don't have a free press in Britain. Nigel, uh, you and I are so old, we write books. Uh, nowadays, it's all the other kinds of power that the professor was talking about. And it's true that a huge chunk of our people have migrated from the, the literary world into the virtual uh, world, uh, where we discover that what we thought was a public square uh, was in fact being ruthlessly policed by big tech in alliance with the security state, particularly in the United States. Does that keep you awake at night or give you any qualms at all? I must admit that I hadn't really appreciated or believed in the deep state until I saw the politicization of the FBI. Six individuals at the top of the FBI being very political, non-independent uh, as they should and as the Bureau has always been in the past, almost always been in the past. Uh, I found that very worrying and uh, that is something that we're going to have to guard against in the future. Well, we had 51 senior intelligence figures putting their names and their faces to a claim that the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation. We now know that every word of it was true. We also now know, thanks to Chris Steele's fabrication, that, this, that the so-called Trump dossier was also completely bogus. It was... Uh, and it was reported by CNN... By, it was reported by CNN, by BBC, to the extent that some of those correspondents claimed that they had security uh, sources that had confirmed some aspects of the material from leaks from within the National Security <laughs> Agency. I mean, that, I'm afraid, is just sheer nonsense. They haven't apologised, though. They fabricated, they made up stories. None of it was true. And as a re result of that, Chris Steele, uh, his fabrications have now been exposed, but he's still out there producing yet more bogus reports. But were the Russians involved in putting uh, Trump in power? Did well, they get it, it, involved it, in a dirty campaign? There is no to doubt. Discredit the opposition? There is no doubt that the Russians campaigned covertly, both for, for Trump and, bizarrely, for Hillary. I mean, that is what is so extraordinary. But I've never met anybody who said, yes, because of a, a Twitter, one particular Twitter feed, that influenced my vote and I changed my vote as a result. I don't know is the answer. Dr. Driver, uh, the, what we've seen, Elon Musk, a billionaire, paid $44 billion for a $10 billion company, but he's opened the books at Twitter and what, is revealed is very troubling indeed, isn't it? I think it is. I think it is, it is not astonishing to those who've been saying it for a while that much of the, much of the journalistic establishment in this country is repeating either intelligence lies or carefully planted political lies and presenting it as fact. And it, it's really important that people understand that this is why organizations like WikiLeaks, which published the facts, were important. Because now, with WikiLeaks documentation, for example, you can look back at unredacted data from which, have been, which has been declassified and understand how the world really evolved. But the Twitter saga tells you how conversations are manipulated by very rich, very powerful people in order to achieve ends that they want to achieve, whether it is in COVID, in misleading people about the scale, the effect of the pandemic, the, the restrictions that need to be in place, the timeliness of the restrictions, what kind of protections you need to take into it or on other things. So the truth is more important than ever before if we want justice and equality. But they don't get much richer than Elon Musk and he's the one who is now exposing all these lies and falsehoods. So thank goodness for some rich and powerful men. Uh, there's no time left for me to soliloquize. I just say that 2022 
for me, was the year in which the liberals were unmasked as the tyrants and authoritarians and the conservatives who turned out to be the believers in liberty. Who would have thunk it? I wish you all, however unlikely, a happy new year.